Good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. And uh, happy Mother's Day to those to whom it applies. And because it doesn't apply to everybody, I mean, clearly to Larry and I and Bob, it doesn't apply. But to Peg, it applies. Uh, by the way, notice I said to Peg, and I said to Bob, Peg's over here today. Bob's over here today. And if you were here, you'd know why. <laughs> <laughs> it's good to have all of you here. Thank you, Clark, for today's music, and, and thank you, everyone, for uh, for tuning in here on YouTube Land uh, to watch our service today on on Sunday, March fourteenth, Mother's Day, twenty twenty three. March fourteenth, May. For, you know, I finally got the number right. I finally got the number right. I was going to say I'm, gonna, I'm thinking to myself, I'm going to impress Larry with the right May fourteenth, Mother's Day. 2023. Well, I've got what? Uh, let me see. Six more Sundays to get it right uh, <laughs> before we're done. Uh, today is Mother's Day. I hope you're having a good day. And something I said on my radio show this last Thursday, uh, if your mother's still alive, give her a call. She'll probably be glad to hear from you. Uh, I, I wish I could. Uh, but happy Mother's Day. Today's sermon is, is an interesting subject matter. Uh, a little over a year ago, we were in Matthew in my Wednesday Bible study and looking at the opening genealogies in Matthew of the genealogy of Jesus. There are four women that are mentioned. There's actually five, but I'm not spending time with Mary, the last one. There's four women in there, and I, and I talked about these four women that are in the genealogy of Jesus. And, and Marlo Knox, when it was over, she says, you know, I've never heard a sermon on these women, in fact, I've never even heard any teaching on them until you do this today. Uh, can, can, can you do a sermon on that, maybe for Mother's Day? And I said, well, since I hadn't planned my sermons yet, yes, here we are. So what I'm about to look at today is courtesy of Marlo Knox, who asked me to do this. Uh, we're reading from the Gospel of Matthew, the chapter 1, up through verse 16. Uh, actually, I'll probably read verse 17 as well. So... From the New International Translation, it says this. A record of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac. Isaac, the father of Jacob. Jacob, the father of Judah and his brothers. Judah, the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. Perez, the father of Hezron. Hezron, the father of Ram. Ram, the father of, of Aminadab. Aminadab, the father of Nashon. Nashon, the father of Salmon. Salmon, the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Boaz, the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. Obed, the father of Jesse, and Jesse, the father of King David. David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. Solomon, the father of Rehoboam, Rehoboam, the father of Abijah, Abijah, the father of Asa, Asa, the father of Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat, the father of Jehoram, Jehoram, the father of Uzziah, Uzziah, the father of Jotham, Jotham, the father of Ahaz, Ahaz, the father of Hezekiah, Hezekiah, the father of Manasseh, Manasseh, the father of Ammon, Ammon, the father of Josiah, and Josiah, the father of Jeconiah and his brothers at the time of the exile to Babylon. After the exile to Babylon, Jeconiah was the father of Sheatiel, Sheatiel, the father of Zerubbabel, Zerubbabel, the father of Ab Abiud, Abiud, the father of Eliakim, Eliakim, the father of Azor, Azor, the father of Zadok, Zadok, the father of Achim, Achim, the father of Elihud, Elihud, the father of Eleazar, Eleazar, the father of Mathan, and Mathan, the father of Jacob, and Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Messiah. Thus, there were 14 generations in all from Abraham to David, 14 from David to exile to Babylon, and 14 from the exile to the Messiah. And thus is the reading of God's holy word may grant us understanding this day on Mother's Day. And by the way, on Mother's Day, or if you're thinking about becoming a mother or you happen to have a, a daughter who's pregnant, you want a, some, some, some really good names for your grandchildren, I just read a bunch of them. You know, come on, don't you guys want a Sheatiel to hold? And Okay, all right. I'm going to give you some other names before this day is over with. So this is the genealogy of David. It's also the genealogy of Jesus. 
as it comes down. Luke's gospel also has a genealogy, but it doesn't appear in chapter one as Matthew says. Luke's differs a little bit from Matthew's, but that's another story. But as I said, as I, we were looking at this almost a year ago, maybe a little over a year ago, I didn't check the dates. The four names that pop out in, these, in this list of men who are giving birth to their sons and the generation is following the line of David on down to Jesus, there are four women that pop up in this list. And I find myself interesting, why would any woman be mentioned? Because you don't find that too much. There's other genealogies in the scripture. You start reading the, the book of Chronicles, the first nine chapters are just genealogies. And, and you begin to get just bored silly. It's like, I don't care. But in the middle of this genealogy are four names of four women, and I find each one of them interesting. So let's take a little look at them, shall we? First of all, in verse 3, it says, Judah was the father of Perez, and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. Now there's the first woman whose mother was Tamar. Well, if you go back to Genesis uh, chapter 39, you read about Judah. Judah had three sons. Uh, Ur, Onan, and Shelah. Ur, his oldest, was married to Tamar. But Ur died. In fact, Genesis says that he, he was an evil man, so God brought an end to him. Ur dies. There are no children. What does that mean to Tamar? Well, she doesn't have any claim then on anything that belongs to Ur, therefore anything that belongs to Ur's father because she has no children. Now the tradition was that if you have brothers and you die, it is your brother's duty, the next oldest, to have a sexual relationship with his sister-in-law so that she can give birth and have heirs in the name of of the dead husband. This, folks, this has gone on for, well, I don't know about today, but in the biblical times, it went on for generations. In fact, it's something I, I love to have fun with when I'm doing a wedding. I, I'll turn to the best man, to the maid of honor, and I say, do you guys understand what your role is here in this marriage? And they said, yeah, yeah, we're, we hold the ring and we're given the toast. I said, no, that's the wedding ceremony. I ask you, do you know your role in this marriage? And, and they go, huh? And I, I point to the dude and I say, you realize that if your friend here that you're standing next to uh, can't have children, uh, it's your duty to provide them. <laughs> and I say the same thing to the woman. I got to tell you, I get some really incredible responses from uh, no way in hell to, <laughs> to one guy one time went, ooh, I like that. We almost had a fist fight between the groom and his best man because the guy's pervin on his, on his bride, you know, but... But uh, I have a lot of fun with that. I, I had one woman turn to run out of the church when I said that to her. <laughs> I said, no, that, that's tradition. But that's really where the best man and the maid of honor came from, is that they will step in if something happens to the bride or the groom. Well, I told you, Ur died. And so Judah gives his daughter-in-law, Tamar, to his second son, Onan. Onan didn't want to father any children through Tamar. And the scripture text says he spilt his seed on the ground. Now look at The sin in that is that he didn't provide for his sister-in-law what she had every right to receive children if possible through her husband's brother god then it says in genesis chapter 39 killed onan as well because what onan did by not providing for his sister-in-law was considered evil in the eyes of yahweh god of israel what does judah do he's got two sons he has a third son shelah does he give shelah to Tamar. Well, what he says to Tamar is, is look, my, 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 my son is, is rather young here. Uh, why don't you go and live with your people? And then when, when Shelah becomes of age, I will let him take you as wife to bear children. She says, okay, but guess what? Judah never lives up to that. 
I mean, Tamar's just in the, in, in the next town over. She knows she knows about her father-in-law. She's easy to follow. I mean, you're talking about some rich people with a lot of sheep walking around with their dad, and they have they have eleven brothers and a sister. Uh, and she finally figures out that uh, Judah isn't going to do this. Well, Judah's wife dies. And one day Judah goes into the town where Tamar lives and she finds out about it. So she dresses herself up as a prostitute and she waits for her father-in-law to come into town and she gets his attention. And he comes up to her and he says, hey, babe, he doesn't recognize her. Uh, what will it take for you and I to get together? And she says, well, how about one of your sheep or one of your goats? He says, okay, I can do that. And she says, well, you tell me you can do that. What do I get until you do? And so he gives her his ring, his staff, and a piece of his clothing. You hold those until I come back. She says, okay. He goes and he has sex with her. He leaves. The next day he comes back with a goat to pay the woman. She's not there. And he asks the men at the gate, where's the prostitute that was here at the wall? And they said, there's been no prostitute here. And he, well, he's thinking, yeah, there was. I, I lost a ring in this whole deal, not to mention my staff and a piece of my clothing. Uh, no, there's, there's been no prostitute here. And so uh, he goes back wondering, okay, what the heck? Three months later, it becomes reported to him that his daughter, his daughter-in-law Tamar has played the prostitute and she's pregnant. Judah doesn't put it together. But he demands justice. This is a woman who's supposed to be being saved for his youngest son, and she's out playing the prostitute. So he, he brings her forward to have a trial. He's going to have her put to death for, 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 for participating in prostitution. And she says, I tell you what, the man who these belong to is the father of my baby. And she holds up the ring and the staff. What does Judah know now at this moment? It's his daughter. What does he do? Does he get angry? Why did, why, why, why did you pretend to me? Why, why did, no, 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 no. In fact, Judah's response is quite the opposite of what you might expect. Judah looks at his pregnant daughter-in-law and he says, I want to make sure I quote it, she is more righteous than I am because I owed her my son. Judah realizes she did what was necessary to make sure that she got the inheritance from him. And Judah is humbled, he's humiliated, and he does a couple of things. He takes Tamar into his house, raising her as his daughter-in-law. He never has relationships with her again, and she gives birth to two children. Twins, Perez and his brother. Tamar, a woman who played a prostitute, is in the lineage of David and Jesus. And they're mentioned in the book of Matthew. Genesis. Well, mentioned in the book of Matthew. And, and Genesis, well, yes, but this time I'm not incorrect. That's the first woman. Let's look at the second woman. We go on down a little bit. And it says, Nashon was the father of Salmon, and Salmon the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Now we get to a different story. Tamar played a prostitute. Rahab was a prostitute. When you get into the book of Judges, Joshua, I'm sorry, Joshua chapter 2 Joshua sends two men into the town of, uh, of Jericho to spy it out. To, uh, 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 Moses is now dead. The people, the, the 40 years in the wilderness are over with. God says to Joshua, take the people, lead them into the promised land. Well, the first thing standing in front of them is the ancient city of Jericho. And uh, so Joshua sends two men into the city to spy it out. And while they're there, they go to a prostitute named Rahab to spend the night. And Rahab recognizes these guys as Israelites. And she says, I tell you what, 
you guys stay here with me. I will protect you for I have heard about what your God did to the Egyptians. I have heard about what your God did, did, did to, 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 to Amos and a couple of other kings while they were wandering on the wilderness. Everybody who came confronting the Israelites gets destroyed by the Israelites. She says, I know that your God is sending you through here and you guys will conquer us. I know that. She goes, but I, I, and Rahab says something really interesting also. I know that your God is God of gods. She says, so please, when you come in here to destroy my city, would you please protect me because I'm protecting you. Some men from Jericho come into her house. They're looking around and she says, yeah, of course there's been men here. Of course there's been men here. What's her job? She's a prostitute. What does she do? She entertains men. Of course there's been men here in my house. But they left. In fact, if you go out east of the gate, you might find them. So these guys go taken off. Again, she says to them, what will you do? And they say, look, tie a scarlet ribbon in your window. And when we come to attack your city, anybody with you in this house will be saved. But they have to be in this house. If your brothers are out on the streets, they will be put to death and their blood will be on them. So Rahab gathers her family members. Rahab, the prostitute, gathers her family members in her house. Don't know how long it took because if you read it, that a story of Rahab starts in Joshua chapter two, but it doesn't happen until Joshua six when Joshua fought the battle of Jericho. As the Israelites come and the walls fall down and they're destroying the people of Jericho, they come to the, to the house of Rahab and it's filled with people. And everyone there gets saved. And it says that Rahab and her family continued to live near the people of Israel. They weren't welcome inside the camp of Israel, but they were always on the outside. And they were always part of the group of people that continued to live and that continued to move. Well, something happened because she met, she met Salmon. Yes. Salmon, the father of Boaz, and Boaz's mother was Rahab, the former prostitute. So you have in the lineage of, uh, of King David and of Jesus the Messiah, we have so far two women, one of them who played a prostitute and was told, you are more righteous than I. Another one that was a prostitute and says, your God is God. Well, if you know anything about Boaz, Boaz marries a woman. Boaz marries a woman named Ruth, and that, that, that's what it says. Boaz, the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. Now, now, here we have another story. In fact, this woman, Ruth, has her own book in the Bible. Ruth was the daughter-in-law of a woman named, named Naomi. There was a famine in the land of Israel, and Naomi and her husband, uh, Abinadab, oh, I want to make sure I get the name correct, uh, Elimelech, I'm sorry, wrong name. She and her husband Elimelech go into, into Moab because there is food there and they take with them their two sons. Here's a couple of good names, Malon and Kilion. And we, we, we made fun of the sons of Saddam Hussein, Uday and Kusay, right? You got Malon and Kilion. And shortly after they get to, to uh, Moab, both of these men meet two women. Malon meets Ruth and marries her. Uh, 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 Malon, Kilion meets Orpah and marries her. Then their father, Elimelech, what's his name? Elimelech. Elimelech dies. Okay, that's tragic. But she has two sons who are both married. Perhaps things will go well. These people will have children and her life will be blessed. After 10 years and no children, both of Naomi's sons-in-law die. I mean, it's really a tragic story when you, when you look at it that way. I mean, it's very, very sad. Naomi learns that life is good back in Israel again. The, the, the famine is over. And although she has no inheritance, 
Because in the 10 years that she's been gone, they have foregone their own land holdings in Israel. It's been taken over by somebody else. So she really has nowhere to go, but she knows she's not a Moabite, she's an Israelite. She's gonna return back in her singleness and her sorrow. She even says, don't call me Naomi, call me bitter. Uh, and she's gonna go back. But these two daughters, daughter-in-laws, they start following her. And Naomi turns around and says, what are you following me for? Am I gonna get remarried and give birth to two more sons? Are they gonna grow up and marry you? No, you're still young. Go home to your people and, 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 and get married. Orpah, weeping and, and, and crying, kisses Naomi and returns to her people. But Ruth, Ruth demonstrates herself to be a woman of great nobility. I mean, she's a very noble woman, a woman of honor. Ruth says to her, what, I mean, Naomi says to her, look, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and to her gods. Why don't you go back with her? And, and, and Ruth says to her, don't urge me to leave you or turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. May Yahweh deal with me, be it ever so severely, if anything but death separates you and me. When Naomi realized that Ruth was Determined to go with her, she stopped urging her, and Ruth follows her back to Israel. They come back, they establish a, some kind of a living, and Naomi gets honored because of the duty of this Moabite woman named Ruth, who, who greatly honors her and takes care of her, and goes out into the field to glean uh, extra for, for herself and for her mother-in-law, and she catches the eye of the guy named Boaz. Boaz says, who is this woman? Well, that's the daughter-in-law of Naomi. She is a woman of great honor. And, and, and Boaz starts ordering his men to leave more uh, 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 vegetables and, and fruit on the ground than what would normally be there after they pick the harvest so that Naomi and Ruth can eat. And, 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 and uh, he ends up finding about who she is and how Naomi had lost the land. He buys the land back for Naomi. Uh, so that she can have her land back. But the thing he's interested in is Ruth, her daughter-in-law. And it ends up working out. And Naomi even encourages Ruth, look, look at this man has cast his eyes upon you. Why don't you do this and do that? And, and, and Ruth is very obedient, follows her. And she ends up marrying Boaz. And what's beautiful about this is what's it say? Boaz, the father of Obad, whose mother was Ruth, Obed, the father of Jesse, and Jesse, the father of King David. Ruth is David's grandmother. Now you may say, Scott, that's, that, that's a great story. And I think it is. Well, well, big deal. Look at your first two, you got a woman who played a prostitute, the second one, a woman who was a prostitute. We can see how that, that, that looks a little weird, a little bit off. But what's off about the story of Ruth? Well, just one thing. And it's a passage in the book of Deuteronomy, which is written long before this event happened. And this passage, this passage, ah, there we go, it's working. Deuteronomy chapter 23, 3 through 6. No Ammonite or Moabite or any of their descendants may enter the assembly of the Lord, not even in the 10th generation. For they did not come to meet you with bread and water on your way when you came out of Egypt. And they hired Balaam, son of Beor, from Pethor in Aram Naharim to pronounce a curse on you. However, the Lord your God would not listen to Balaam, but turn the curse into a blessing for you because the Lord your God loves you. Do not seek a treaty of friendship with them as long as you live. What two people are in that? Ammonite and Moabite. Ammonite and Moabite. Ruth was a what? Moabite. She was a Moabite. Do you understand? Naomi should have left Ruth in Moab according to the law of God. Do nothing with them. This woman who we look at and we realize she is a woman of honor. 
should not have even been touched. How in the world does she end up in the genealogy of Jesus? Finally, the fourth woman. After it says, Obed, the father of Jesse, and Jesse, the father of King David, David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. Now this I find, did you guys catch that when I read it? It doesn't say her name, does it? What's her name? Bathsheba. Bathsheba. David and Bathsheba, you've heard the story. David, while he's king, when he's older, uh, David in his younger days was always out fighting with his own men. He led them often. You, you read the scripture text, David had his big three, and then he had his 30, and then there were other men below them. And you're talking about, in, in David's day, an undefeatable army. They had victory wherever they went. There was David, the three, the 30, and then everybody else. Now David is older. Uh, his country is still at war. David's just not out with them anymore like he used to be. He's hanging out back home in the city of David, Jerusalem. And uh, he's out on the roof of his house one day while his men are out in battle. And he looks down on another roof of a house and he sees a woman. She's bathing. She's naked. And he he kind of likes what he sees. And he says, who is that? And the men say, oh, that's Bathsheba. The daughter of, uh, uh, of Eliam, the husband of Uriah. And David says, bring her here. If you know the story, he and Bathsheba have sex. Uh, when she's pregnant, David can't get her husband Uriah to come into the town. He says, I can't go and have pleasure with my wife uh, while my men are out here fighting. See, David wanted him to come in and have a relationship so that when she's pregnant, it's his baby, you see. And David won't get caught. David then ends up ordering a withdrawal of the truce, but keep Uriah out in front. Uriah gets killed. David, to comfort Uriah's now grieving widow, takes her and marries her and all is well. Except for one thing, God's aware of what happened. And God sends the prophet Nathan to come to David and to tell him, no, David, no, what you did was wrong. And the, the blood of Uriah is on your head and the baby that is being born will die. Now, if that's not bad enough, we're told when David says, who is this? And by the way, this is in 2 Samuel chapter 11. He's told she's the daughter of, Eli of, of Eliam and the husband of Uriah. Her name is Bathsheba. Bring her here. Now, what's the issue with that? Well, if you read 2 Samuel chapter 23, we read about what I just talked about, David's big three and David's 30. The 30 men plus the three who went everywhere with David in his younger years. They were all together as David was trying to, to escape from Saul, where King Saul was constantly out trying to kill David. They were with David during all of this time. Do you know what two names we find in the list of the 30? Uriah. Uriah and his father-in-law, Eliam. These were men who fought along with David. And so when David said, who is this woman? They're basically saying, these are your men's, that, that's one of your man's daughters and one of your man's wives. And David didn't care. And Bathsheba participated in it. It doesn't indicate she was raped, folks. I had a big argument with some women over that one time and I'll never, I'll never use that R word in that story again. She loses that child, it dies. But then she gets pregnant again. And as I said here, she has Solomon who becomes the king and follows David. And through Solomon then, the promise of the Messiah comes with Jesus. Four women. One played a prostitute. One was a prostitute. The other one was somebody who, according to the law of God, says have nothing to do with. And the fourth one was a woman who was an adulteress. But yet they're in the lineage of David. They're in the lineage of Jesus. What do we make of that? I'll tell you what I make of it, folks. 
How big is God's grace? How much does God love us? What does the scripture text say? For God so loved the world that he did what? He gave his one and only son that whoever would believe in him will not die but have everlasting life. When I look at these four women in the genealogy of Jesus, all who became mothers, whose sons then are also in that genealogy, I think of this. Who am I? Who are you? Who are we to say, God doesn't want me. Does God know what I've done? What's the answer? Yes. Yes. And if we can have the name of Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, and Bathsheba, even though her name isn't mentioned, in the genealogy of our Lord, who are we to deny ourselves the grace of God? And I've had people say that. You know where we hear it the most, right? In prison, when we go in there. Does God know what I did? Yes. And even so, God died for you. Brothers and sisters, this is what I get when I read about these four women. Four women, each with some questionable background, even though one of them was incredibly honorable, but yet they have the joy of having their name be read every time you read the Gospel of Matthew as being the grandparents of the Messiah. Brothers and sisters, what is it that you and I can do or have done that God will say, I don't want you. Lord, we thank you for these women and for what it means. Guide us to be grateful and thankful and to understand that you know who we are, you know our past, but yet you accept us anyway because you died for us. Lord, we thank you for that. And guide us as we try to come to grips with that because a lot of us think we're just so hideous that God doesn't care. But God does care. As I said, he died for us. So Lord, we thank you for these four women who remind us that no matter how vile I might be, you still love me. And you want to use me and us and your church and as your people. We thank you for these things now. In the name of Jesus, we pray it. Amen. Happy Mother's Day, folks, and have a good day.